Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being with us today uh, and welcome. Happy New Year's. Welcome back. Hope everybody is doing well and keeping safe. Um, before we start our main presentation today with Dr. Firon, we do have updates for you, uh, particularly given that we haven't done grand rounds in a few weeks. And of course, there's been a lot going on in regards to um, the, the, the Omicron surge. Uh, before that, I'm going to start with Dr. Dunn, who's going to um, give us an update on inclusion rounds. Dr. Dunn, thanks as always for being with us um, here and thanks for providing updates. Of course. Thank you, Dr. Osdalga. Osdalga. Um, I wanted to let you all know, first of all, Happy New Year to everyone. And I wanted to let you know about an inclusion rounds that is coming up on January 20th at noon. From noon to one, we are going to have a very special event uh, welcoming Lou Morner. Um, she's going to be doing a presentation in honor of Native American Heritage Month. Uh, which was in November, but she is going to present an inclusion rounds called Welcome to Indian Country, an overview of history and health in California's tribal populations. She's been an advocate for native populations for many years, has done a lot of work in um, tobacco prevention, and is going to come and give us some background as well as some tips on how we can be more supportive and be better advocates for our Native American patients. So I will be putting the link for that in the chat. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Dr. Dunn. Um, uh, Dr. Pinsky, you were just going to mention um, the, about the positives as well. Did you want to mention that? Thanks, Errol. I'll, I'll steal back one minute. Let me just show this slide um, just to update what Errol was saying. I can't get into full screen. And you, oh, there we go. Um, this is our epidemic curve for Omicron. You can see it has completely taken over uh, from Delta uh, as consistent with the rest of the country. Um, our seven day positivity rate is approaching 20%. Yesterday we had 635 positives out of 3,250 3, tests. So testing and positivity rate is increasing. Um, and through uh, the end of last week, we had uh, 2,000 Omicron variants that were genotypes. So just reiterating the extent of this surge um, and the number of cases. So thank you and happy again to take any questions in the chat. So much, Dr. Pinsky again. And I just want to mention, uh, so next week we have a uh, topic is going to be on uh, long COVID. We have doctors uh, Bonia uh, Jang and uh, Dr. Singh, who's with us uh, back here, helping us answer questions as well. Uh, so looking forward to that. But today we have uh, a talk I've been looking forward to hearing for quite some time. Uh, Dr. Firon is going to be presenting, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Elgin Lewis, uh, uh, who's, a, as you know, Division Chief of Cardiology, who's going to introduce him. Dr. Lewis, thanks also for being with us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Osdaga. And, and I have to say, it's a true pleasure to have an opportunity to, to introduce Dr. Bill Furon. He attended Dartmouth College um, and received his medical degree from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He did his internal medicine residency here at Stanford and then did an extra year as the chief resident. Um, and then also um, he did his fellowship at Stanford and also served as a chief fellow. He's a professor of medicine and cardiology. He's uh, the affinity lead and the director of interventional cardiology here at Stanford University and also is the chief of the cardiovascular, uh, the cardiology section at the VA Palo Alto healthcare system. He's been elected to both the American Society for Clinical Investigation and the Association of University Cardiologists. And his primary research uh, over an extensive career has uh, involved coronary physiology, and uh, he's led a very important clinical trials. He's been the principal investigator of numerous uh, trials, including the FAME trial, which have resulted in pub, uh, multiple publications in the New England Journal, and has really changed how we practice medicine and the adoption of the use of coronary physiology to guide revascularization decisions in cardiac catheterization labs. He's also derived and validated the index of microcirculatory resistance, which is now commonly used to assess coronary microvascular function. Uh, he has uh, over 250 publications. He's um, a sought after speaker at uh, major international conferences and also serves on the editorial board of the Journal of American College of Cardiology, Circulation, Jack Cardiovascular Interventions, and Circulation Cardiovascular Interventions, among a lot of other journals. His research lab has had pretty much continuous NIH funding, and he's currently the principal investigator on an NIH grant eval evaluating cardiac allograft vasculopathy and just had a very important publication in this space uh, just last week in Jack. He's received multiple teaching awards from Stanford and has mentored numerous clinician scientists. 
His clinical activities um, include not only percutaneous coronary interventions, but also uh, trans trans uh, catheter aortic valve replacement. Today, uh, Bill will be talking about PCI or Cabot for multivessel coronary disease, the FAME 3 trial, and look forward to hearing it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lewis, uh, for that nice introduction. And um, thank you uh, to the Department of Medicine for the invitation uh, to speak today. Uh, let me just share my screen. Can everyone uh, see that okay and hear me okay? Great. Okay, great. So, um, Yes, it's my pleasure and honor to speak about revascularization for multivessel coronary disease, and in particular, the FAME 3 trial. Uh, these are my disclosures. I receive research support from Abbott, Boston Scientific, and Medtronic, uh, as well as the NIH, and have consulting relationships with CathWorks, HeartFlow, and Siemens. So what I'll try to do in the next half hour or so is review some of the historical data comparing percutaneous coronary intervention, or PCI, with coronary artery bypass grafting, or CABG, uh, for multivessel coronary disease, and then uh, touch on what has changed since those uh, historical trials were performed, uh, namely the evolution of drug-eluting stents and the uh, advent of fractional flow reserve-guided PCI, which I'll describe in detail and then um, present uh, the data from the FAME 3 trial, which we uh, presented uh, a month or so ago at the uh, TCT meeting. I'd like to start with a case presentation. This is a patient I was involved with about three years ago, um, a 53-year-old man with hypertension, dyslipidemia, and tobacco use who was admitted with chest pain. Uh, while at work as a radio frequency technician, he developed left-sided chest pain walking down the hallway that he described as a burning. It lasted about five minutes and then it resolved with rest. He and his coworkers were concerned enough that EMS was called and he was brought to the emergency department here at Stanford. Uh, when he presented, his blood pressure was high at 170 over 90, but otherwise he had a normal cardiovascular exam. His troponin was slightly elevated. His hemoglobin A1C was 5.9% and his lipids showed an LDL of 142. His initial ECG showed some uh, J-point elevation in lead three. There was ST segment depression in leads one, L, and uh, V5 and V6, and some poor R-wave progression. And so the question, uh, first question that comes up regarding treatment options is uh, what to do next. Um, one approach would be medical therapy with uh, some sort of non-invasive imaging, either a stress imaging or a test or a CT uh, coronary angiogram or um, an invasive coronary angiogram. And just recently, uh, the latest coronary revascularization guidelines were published. And my colleague uh, at the Palo Alto VA, Selena Young, was a, a co author of these recommendations. And they recommended, uh, a, with a 1A recommendation, that in patients with non ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome, like, like this one, who are at elevated risk of recurrent ischemic events and are appropriate candidates for revascularization, an invasive strategy with the intent to proceed with revascularization is indicated to reduce cardiovascular events. And so, uh, for that reason, um, we uh, elected to move uh, directly uh, to the invasive coronary angiography. Now, I would like to highlight that there has been a bit of a paradigm shift in our management of stable coronary disease. Uh, so not this type of patient, but patients who have uh, stable symptoms and are found to have um, ischemia on stress testing. Um, this is a landmark study that um, my colleague David Marin uh, ran and uh, published recently in the New England Journal, the ischemia trial where they randomized uh, over 5,000 patients with stable coronary disease to either an invasive strategy going directly to uh, PCI or cabbage um, based on the angiogram or to a more conservative strategy with medical therapy up front. And as you can see during follow-up, there was no real significant difference uh, in the two strategies. And so for that reason, in stable patients, we are moving more towards uh, a trial of medical therapy first, um, unless symptoms are refractory to that. But again, this case uh, was different. This was a, an acute coronary syndrome patient. So uh, we brought the patient to the cath lab, and this is a picture of the LAD, 
And what you'll see is that the proximal uh, portion has a significant appearing uh, narrowing. This is an angiogram of the circumflex. And what you'll see here is that there are two spots, uh, one in the proximal portion and then one in the obtuse marginal branch that also look uh, significant. And then the right coronary artery is shown here. And this is a very tortuous vessel with uh, two areas in the sort of mid and mid to distal region that are of unclear significance. And then another somewhat concerning area in the posterior descending branch. And so now um, we have a patient with multivessel coronary disease in the setting of an acute coronary syndrome. Uh, revascularization is indicated based on the guidelines. And the question comes up, well, should we perform uh, PCI or bypass in this type of patient? And so I'd like to review some of the historical data. Um, this was a, a study published by Mark Klatke, who's also in our division in cardiology. It's a meta-analysis of 10 randomized studies uh, comparing uh, cabbage with PCI, including over 7,000 patients. And you see it was published in 2009, so it's a bit um, older data. But in this uh, study, they did not see any uh, difference in death or death or MI between the two strategies. They did, however, note a significant interaction based on diabetes. Uh, patients with diabetes tended to fare better with bypass uh, compared with PCI, whereas non-diabetics, there was no real difference. Now, uh, randomized data are helpful, but um, sometimes they can include select patient populations and um, it, it, you know, they're done at uh, high uh, volume centers. It's nice to see registry data as well. And, and this is the ASSERT registry, which is a very large, almost 200,000 uh, patients, Medicare recipients all over 65 years old, who were treated with either PCI or bypass. And uh, the investigators used propensity matching to try to account for the lack of randomization. And they saw a uh, benefit in mortality with bypass compared with PCI. But again, uh, one of the limitations being that these were not uh, randomized patients. Now, both of these uh, data sets involve older uh, data and bare metal stents as well as uh, balloon angioplasty. And, and things have evolved. Um, and in the early 2000s, uh, drug eluding stents uh, became available. And the main uh, major trial uh, looking at uh, first-generation drug-eluting stents was the Syntax trial. And this included 1,800 patients with three-vessel coronary disease or left main disease. And they were randomized to PCI with the Taxis uh, first-generation drug-eluting stent or to bypass. 28% of patients uh, had diabetes, and they had a very aggressive stenting strategy, almost five stents uh, per patient, an average of 86 millimeters, a third of the patients had more than 100 millimeters of stenting uh, done. And this was again in the you know, 2006, seven range published in 2009. The primary endpoint was death, MI, uh, myocardial infarction, stroke or repeat revascularization at one year. And you see that it was significantly reduced uh, with bypass uh, compared with uh, PCI. This was driven primarily by a lower rate of one year repeat revascularization as shown on this slide. Uh, these patients were subsequently followed out to five years and you see that there was a trend towards lower mortality with bypass at five years. There was a definite uh, reduction in myocardial infarction uh, with bypass um, compared with PCI. There was a trend to higher rates of stroke at five years with bypass. Um, and not surprisingly, again, the composite endpoint remains significantly reduced uh, with bypass compared with PCI. Now, uh, one of the important uh, offshoots from the syntax trial was the development and validation of the syntax score. Um, this is an angiographic uh, scoring system which allows us to rate sort of the complexity of coronary disease based on the angiogram and the findings of uh, the disease, whether it's calcified, bifurcation lesions, chronic occlusions, et cetera. And patients with low scores or less complex disease in the syntax trial had very similar outcomes with PCI compared with bypass. Whereas as you got into intermediate or higher syntax scores indicating more complex uh, and more diffuse and severe disease, these patients uh, bypass clearly um, outperformed PCI. Uh, 
So what have we learned from these historical data? Well, patients with more complex coronary disease and diabetics fare better with bypass when compared to angiography-guided PCI, and I'll describe what I mean by that, um, and using first-generation drug-eluting stents. And how do we explain this? Well, the classic uh, explanation is that when we stent, we fix the uh, culprit lesion or lesions, but we don't address any upstream or downstream uh, potential or future culprit lesions. Whereas when you bypass a vessel, you bypass not only the culprit, but you also bypass the remainder of the vessel, which might uh, go on and develop uh, lesions and cause MI. And that's one ex explanation for the lower rates of MI with bypass compared with uh, PCI. So what has changed since those uh, initial studies? Well, stent technology has evolved. We now have second and third generation drug looting stents. And uh, we now have learned that fractional flow reserve and index that we can measure in the cath lab um, improves outcomes when we use it to guide PCI uh, when we, and when we compare it to traditional angiography guided PCI. So first, uh, in relation to stents, uh, you may be familiar, some of you, with the first generation drug loading stents. They were called Cypher and Taxis. They had Sirolimus or Paclitaxel as the drug. And they had thicker struts. They were stainless steel uh, backbone. They had a thicker polymer. And the polymer was a durable one that had an inflammatory uh, reaction that it caused. And this led to late complications like stent thrombosis, and it required prolonged uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. We now have second generation uh, drug eluting stents, uh, Zients, Resolute, and Synergy are some of the names that you may have heard. These are coated with Everolimus or Zoterolimus. They have thinner struts and the backbone is cobalt or platinum chromium, which is, um, it has the same radial force or strength as the stainless steel, but is thinner. There's a thinner polymer coating and a more biocompatible polymer. So we don't see this late inflammatory response. Their rate of um, stent thrombosis and other complications is less and the need for prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy is no longer an issue. So when you look at a comparison of these uh, second generation, like the Everolimus drug looting stent to the first generation Paclitaxel, this is a meta-analysis of uh, three studies uh, including a large number of patients, you see that there are lower rates of myocardial infarction, both at the time of the procedure and also during a three-year follow-up. Uh, this is partly explained by the lower rates of stent thrombosis. The, the Everolimus looting stent has less than half the rate of both early and very late uh, stent thrombosis compared to the paclitaxel looting stent. And all of this translates to a long-term reduction in overall mortality uh, with current generation drug looting stents compared to those uh, first generation ones. What else has changed? Well, I've talked about fractional flow reserve guidance. And what I mean when I refer to that is uh, at the time of a coronary angiogram, um, we can now uh, advance a pressure wire that has a sensor near its tip and measure the distal coronary pressure. And we can compare that to the proximal pressure measured with our guiding catheter. And we do this um, after administering adenosine, which increases blood flow. It simulates uh, stress or exercise. And it, as shown here in the panel on the right, you see the, the red tracing is the proximal coronary pressure and the purple tracing is the distal pressure. And the gradient increases with the adenosine and we look at the mean distal pressure and we compare it to the mean proximal pressure. In this case, it was 60 over 100, giving an FFR of 0 0.60. And that indicates that 60% of the blood flow that should be getting to that area of the heart is actually getting there. We've learned that anything less than um, 0 0.80 uh, is significant for ischemia. And above that um, is indicated indicative of uh, stable disease that can be managed medically. Now, the first study that uh, validated uh, FFR-guided PCI was the FAME-1 trial. This included just over 1,000 patients with two or three vessel disease randomized to angio or FFR-guided PCI. And angio-guided meaning you would just look at the angiogram and based on what you saw, decide whether or not a stent was needed to be placed. Um, and that was the traditional strategy at the time of the study. Um, FFR guidance meant you measured FFR and only if it was low would you place a stent. 
And as you can see here, the rate of major adverse cardiac events at one year was significantly reduced um, with a, a significant reduction in death and MI as well uh, using FFR compared to angio guidance. And this was because there was more selective stenting and avoiding unnecessary stents, which could potentially cause complications, as well as better guidance of exactly where you needed to stent uh, based on the FFR. One of the themes that emerged from the FAME trial was this difference between anatomic and functional disease. So for example, if you looked at all the patients who had angiographic three vessel disease based on your interpretation of the angiogram, after we measured FFR, uh, the majority of the patients had only functionally significant one or two vessel disease based on the FFR. And what that means is we can calculate something we call the functional syntax score. So uh, what we did was uh, in the patients in the FFR guided uh, arm of FAME, we first calculated the classic syntax score based on the angiogram and not taking into account the FFR value. And then we recalculated the score, subtracting any vessels that had negative FFRs. And so not surprisingly, this would reclassify about a third of cases to a lower risk uh, functional syntax score compared to the syntax score. And the, the reason this is relevant is that it turns out that the functional syntax score discriminated the risk for death or MI with PCI better than the classic one. As shown here, you see that First of all, the percentage of patients that were in the highest uh, risk uh, score were lower uh, with the functional syntax score, and the percentage in the lowest risk score were higher um, and had Im uh, improved outcomes compared to the, the high risk cohort. And so um, the, the other question that comes up from this is, well, what about those lesions that you're leaving behind? Um, you know, the deferred lesions that looked significant angiographically, are those gonna come back to haunt us? And one way of looking at this um, is by looking at what we call the residual syntax score, meaning you calculate the syntax score based on the residual disease. And so if there's a lot of residual disease left behind, you would have a higher score and you'd expect higher event rates in those patients. But when we did that, um, we saw that there was really no difference based on the residual syntax score. So after FFR guided PCI, the degree of the residual disease does not predict events when it's not functionally significant, meaning not causing ischemia. And a number of other groups have shown this as well, that if you have an FFR negative lesion, the event rate is quite low compared to um, FFR positive lesions. One of the criticisms of the FAME-1 study was that there was no medical therapy arm. And some people argued that, well, medical therapy would have done just as well as either angio-guided or FFR-guided PCI. And so that was the impetus for the FAME-2 study. Um, this was a trial including stable coronary disease patients with either single or multivessel disease. And the key difference from this of this trial compared to other studies looking at this population was that FFR was first measured. And the reason that was important was it turned out that about a quarter of patients whom the operator thought should be included in the study actually didn't have any lesion with a significant FFR. And we know they do just as well with medical therapy as they do with PCI. And so including them would only dilute any potential benefit from PCI. So they were not included in the study. In order to be included, you had to have at least one stenosis with an abnormal FFR, and then you were randomized to PCI or medical therapy alone. And the primary endpoint was the rate of death, MI, or urgent revascularization at two years. And we found that patients with FFR positive lesions, shown in red here, who were treated medically had a significantly higher event rate compared to either the registry group, the group in green that had negative FFR, or the FFR positive lesions that were treated with PCI, the blue group, which uh, both groups, they had similar outcomes and much lower. Now, one of the criticisms of this was this was primarily driven by urgent revascularization. And uh, some argued that maybe the uh, investigators were biased or the patients were by the fact that they knew they had a lesion that wasn't uh, fixed, quote unquote, and so that they came back more frequently. However, when we looked at the medically treated patients in FAME 2, 
you see that there is a very uh, distinct relationship between the FFR value and their major adverse cardiac event rate at two years, really arguing against any kind of bias and arguing for a, a biologic effect uh, and relationship between the degree of ischemia and your event rate. In addition, um, we follow these patients now out to five years, and uh, you can see that a hard endpoint, spontaneous myocardial infarction, was lower in those patients who had FFR positive lesions that were treated with PCI compared to uh, FFR positive lesions treated with medical therapy alone. And this finding was um, uh, uh, sort of reproduced in the ischemia trial as well. So what can we conclude from these data? Um, FFR identifies lesions which are not hemodynamically significant and will respond well to medical therapy alone. This avoids the acute and long-term risk of unnecessary PCI. FFR also identifies lesions which are hemodynamically significant where the benefit of PCI outweighs uh, its risks. So with this background, uh, newer and better drug-eluting stents and this uh, better way of guiding our PCI, we uh, move forward with the FAME 3 trial. The objective of this study is to demonstrate that FFR-guided PCI with a second-generation uh, drug-eluting stent is non-inferior to bypass surgery in patients with multivessel coronary disease. Now, the unique thing about this study is that it was very Stanford-centric. Um, and I thank Dr. Harrington uh, and also uh, Dr. Young uh, for their support and their uh, belief that we could get this done uh, under budget. Um, and without that support, we wouldn't have been able to do it. This was an investigator-initiated study. We received research grants from Medtronic and Abbott, but Stanford uh, was the sponsor and negotiated all the contracts with um, the individual sites. It, you see it was a group effort. Um, Joe Wu from Cardiac Surgery was involved. Uh, Ken Mahaffey led our clinical events committee. Manisha Desai led the statistical analyses and Mark Clackey is leading the quality of life and cost effectiveness analyses. Uh, the study included all comers with three vessel coronary disease not involving the left main that were amenable to PCI or cabbage uh, as determined by the heart team at each center. There were 48 centers in Europe, North America, Australia, and Asia, and patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to either FFR-guided PCI or bypass. The primary endpoint was the one-year rate of all-cause death, myocardial infarction, stroke, or repeat revascularization. And as mentioned, it was a non-inferiority design with the margin set at a hazard ratio of 1.65. Um, we included 1,500 patients. Uh, these were uh, middle-aged, mostly men with typical risk factors. Uh, about a third were diabetic, 40% uh, uh, presented with an acute coronary syndrome. The time to their procedure, uh, the procedure duration, and the length of hospital stay, not surprisingly, were all significantly lower with PCI compared with bypass. The number of lesions identified was about four and was similar in both groups. And they had similar angiographic characteristics with about 20% having one chronically occluded vessel, about two thirds having a bifurcation lesion. And the syntax score was in the high intermediate range, 26 uh, as shown here on this slide. So again, the primary endpoint was the rate of death, MI, stroke or repeat revascularization at one year. And this occurred in 10.6% of the PCI group and 6.9% of the bypass group. So the hazard ratio was 1.5 with an upper bound at 2.2, meaning that the p-value for non-inferiority was 0.35 and thus PCI was not uh, non-inferior to bypass. When we look at the individual components of the primary endpoint, there were no significant differences in death alone, MI, a stroke or repeat revascularization. And the combination of death MI or stroke, although numerically higher with PCI was also not significantly different. Uh, severe bleeding, acute kidney injury and significant arrhythmia all occurred more frequently after bypass uh, compared with PCI. Uh, definite stent thrombosis and symptomatic graft occlusion were both rare occurrences. And rehospitalization within 30 days uh, occurred uh, significantly more often with bypass compared with PCI. Uh, 
we did subgroup analyses and saw some uh, trends towards interactions based on patient age and sex. But the thing that uh, stuck out the most was this significant interaction based on the syntax score. And what we saw was that in those patients with low syntax score, so these are less complex coronary disease patients, PCI uh, seemed to outperform bypass. Whereas when you go into the intermediate and the high syntax score, you see the reverse where bypass uh, outperforms uh, PCI. Another important uh, comparison is with the historical trial, the syntax study. Um, we see here the patient characteristics are very similar between the two studies with similar age, sex, risk factors, um, number of lesions and syntax score. But interestingly, when you look at the FFR guided uh, PCI arm in FAME 3, it did uh, better than the PCI arm in syntax as well as the cabbage arm in syntax. In addition, the cabbage arm in FAME 3 did better than both. Uh, so both groups uh, significantly improved uh, compared with um, the historical data. And this was despite the fact that uh, the definition for MI was more liberal or lenient in FAME 3 compared to syntax, which had a fairly strict definition. And it brings up the point of uh, looking at uh, the details when you're evaluating studies. And so one of the details in FAME 3 is how procedural MI was defined. Um, MI in FAME 3 had two definitions, one related to the procedure, whether PCI or cabbage, and then spontaneous. And the procedural MI was defined in the same manner for both the cabbage and the PCI group. And it was based essentially on the universal third universal definition of MI. You had to have a biomarker elevation and at least one of the following, either new Q waves, uh, a new graft or uh, uh, cor native coronary occlusion or new imaging evidence of a wall motion abnormality. So a fairly strict definition. Now, there's another accepted definition called the SKY, Society of Cardiac and Angiography and Intervention uh, definition for procedural MI that has two criteria. One is just biomarker alone elevation without any other clinical findings. And the second is biomarker elevation plus uh, new Q waves. And it's interesting when you apply the SKY definition, first of all, you see that the rate of procedural MI is significantly higher in both groups compared to the definition that we used in FAME 3. But you also see that the rate of procedural MI is higher with cabbage than PCI. And if one were to have used this definition, it would have completely altered the interpretation of the FAME 3 trial. So I think it's just, again, important to look at details when you're evaluating studies and not just pay attention to the, the top line. We had um, the honor of uh, publishing the paper in the New England Journal, and so you can refer to that uh, for details. Now, let's go back to the case I presented at the beginning. This was um, a 53-year-old man admitted with acute coronary syndrome with three-vessel disease. And um, Fatima Rodriguez, uh, one of my colleagues in cardiology, was the ward attending. And so after doing this angiogram, we stopped uh, to discuss and review the case. Uh, we brought in Jack Boyd from cardiac surgery uh, and had a heart team approach. And we felt that the uh, patient was eligible for either PCI or cabbage. And for that reason, and because the patient agreed, thankfully, um, he consented to participate in the FAME 3 trial. And he was randomized to FFR guided PCI. And this shows the FFR of that LAD lesion. Again, the green tracing is the distal pressure wire uh, tracing and the red tracing is the guide catheter. And you see that the FFR is quite abnormal at 0 0.57 indicating that lesion is functionally significant. And so we went ahead and performed PCI. On the circumflex, you also see a very low FFR. On the left side of the screen is the gradient at rest, and then adenosine is administered, the flow increases, and you get even a more significant gradient. And so the FFR, again, was quite low. And so this patient underwent a PCI of the two lesions in the circumflex and obtuse marginal branch. And then interestingly, that right coronary, uh, the tortuous vessel, was not significant uh, with an FFR of 0.88 meaning that 
instead of placing perhaps three stents, uh, we could avoid those stents and feel confident that treating that patient medically, there would likely be a good outcome, or at least as good as if we place stents. And so I just recently saw this patient uh, in November um, in my clinic. Um, he's now three years out from his PCI. He's had no intervening cardiac events. He feels well and is able to walk three miles without symptoms. He's currently on aspirin, ticagrelor, a high-dose statin, an ACE inhibitor, and a beta blocker. His blood pressure is reasonably well controlled. It might be even a little bit better, but it was 130 over 74. His LDL was at only 57. His triglycerides were a bit on the high side. But I, he had a very nice outcome, and I think that's likely because he had focal, uh, less complex disease with a low syntax score and a low functional syntax score, and probably fell into that uh, category of patients who do, does better with uh, PCI. So in conclusion, in patients with three-vessel coronary disease, FFR-guided PCI with a current generation drug-eluting stent did not meet the criterion set for non-inferiority in comparison with bypass in terms of death, MI, stroke, or revascularization at one year. The one-year rate of death, MI, or stroke was not significantly different between the two groups. Uh, the MACE rates for both the PCI and the cabbage arm in FAME 3 were lower than the cabbage arm in the syntax trial. Uh, FFR-guided PCI with a current generation DES performed favorably in comparison with bypass in three-vessel disease patients with less complex disease based on the syntax score. However, in patients with more complex three-vessel coronary disease, cabbage clearly remains uh, the treatment of choice. So what's next? Um, we are now performing quality of life analyses. Um, certainly uh, many patients uh, value how they feel um, after a procedure just as much, if not more than whether or not they have, for example, a procedural MI. Um, we are also trying to identify subgroups who benefit most from bypass and those in whom PCI is a reasonable option. And we're performing longer term follow-up out to three and five years. And our hope is that with these data, we will able to make more refined uh, decisions, uh, both uh, with our patients and as physicians uh, regarding revascularization uh, in patients with multivessel coronary disease. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you. Thanks, Dr. for moderating, appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and, and, uh, First of all, Dr. Furon, thank you for an outstanding uh, Grand Rounds. This has been uh, great. And one of the things that I think you've you illustrated in the last uh, slide is um, the fact that we've made significant improvements in how we manage patients with acute coronary syndrome and coronary artery disease. And I think it's uh, in part due to the work that you've done. Um, we have some great questions that are coming up, but before I uh, address some of these questions, um, in light of the effect modification that you see with the syntax score, uh, between the syntax score and the, the benefit of PCI versus cabbage, uh, do you think it's reasonable to kind of look at kind of lower risk patients um, and, and consider whether or not complex uh, lesions um, can be addressed um, routinely for these patients and whether or not that's, that deserves uh, further investigation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... I think that, you know, from a statistician standpoint, um, this is just hypothesis generating because we did not power uh, for that analysis, although it was a pre-specified analysis and it has been shown to be the case in other studies. So I believe that there's something there and intuitively it makes sense, you know, if you have less complex disease. And particularly if you're able to eliminate, you know, one or two lesions based on FFR and um, sort of more judiciously use your stents and then maximize your medical therapy, I think we can uh, improve uh, the outcomes compared with the historical data and get close to, if not equivalent to uh, cabbage uh, data. Perfect. Um, and you also illustrated uh, the improvements in the, the stents that are used, especially the drug eluting stent technology and the, the reduction in kind of instant restenosis. Uh, there's a question that, um, that talked about the improvements of PCI over the last two decades, but have there been similar advances in cabbage or basically are we doing the same operation? Yeah, another great question. Um, so 
I guess the second question, um, cabbage, um, it's interesting that they, they, we didn't anticipate that the cabbage root group would do so well in FAME 3. In fact, we, we thought they would do similar to what was seen in syntax. And if they had, uh, the study probably would have shown non-inferiority um, based on the event rates. But there was a great improvement. And I think there probably has been some uh, surgical techniques that have uh, improved, although there's nothing really that you can hang your hat on. But I think the patient, the patient selection and their um, attention and that they pay to, um, you know, preventing stroke and things like that um, has improved outcomes. The other thing that was really striking that we saw in the FAME 3 study was when we looked at the medical therapy, it was significantly better compared to syntax. So for example, in FAME 3 at one year, about 95% of the cabbage patients were on a statin, whereas in the syntax trial, that was around 75%. And we saw similar uh, differences in beta blocker usage as well. And so I think um, the medical therapy uh, really probably improved outcomes uh, in the cabbage arm and other studies have shown that as well. So I think that's the explanation uh, regarding that. Perfect, thank you. And as, you, as we started comparing, a continuing comparison between cabbage and PCI, you know, one clear concern that patients have is their cognitive um, their cognitive abilities after an intervention. And as part of your quality of life assessment, uh, were you kind of measuring uh, kind of uh, any measures of cognitive function? Yeah, you know, one of the challenges of, as you know, <laughs> of doing these large studies are the finances. And we were really operating on a shoestring budget. You know, this wasn't uh, your classic industry sponsored study where we had you know, and unending funds. Um, we had basically these research grants that we had to make everything fit into. And so we do have, I think, uh, some very useful quality of life data, um, but we weren't able to do um, measures of cognitive function just because um, of the funding situation. So we will not unfortunately have uh, those data, but hopefully the other um, quality of life data we have will sort of take that into account. Okay, it sounds great. And um, Dr. Levy asks about uh, were there more versus less complex lesion scores in the FAME 3 pre specified or post hoc analysis? Uh, I'm sorry, whether I, I missed part of that. So, so I guess uh, were the lesions uh, more complex or less complex in FAME 3 compared to um, kind of what you expected? Oh yes, that's a that's an excellent question. So yeah, you know we we knew from previous studies that really complex patients probably do best with bypass, and there isn't really you know what we call equipoise in that setting. So our hope was to enroll you know the less complex patients, um, and we tried to do that by, for example, in our inclusion and exclusion criteria, we. Um, you know, you can only have one CTO, for example. Uh, we didn't mandate measuring the syntax score because, to be honest, um, most clinical sites aren't doing it routinely. And there's unfortunately a lot of variability um, unless you have a core lab do, do it. And that was not really feasible uh, up front to have that done. So um, we, we had hoped to get a lower complex group, but um, as we saw, the syntax score was 26, meaning that this was a fairly complex subset of patients, um, and that probably um, went, worked against us as far as trying to show non-inferiority. And I think um, going along with that, what happened is that there were already sites that were using FFR, and they probably measured FFR in a portion of their patients, and it turned out that they only had one or two vessel disease, so they were no longer eligible for randomization. So it kind of skewed things towards a more complex group of patients. Perfect. Um, yeah, Dr. Lin mentions that the patients seem to be on ticagrelor for three years. Um, so asked, did you recommend for kind of three years of DAPT uh, for these high-risk uh, multivessel CAD, or did you kind of go with the standard uh, one to two years? Yeah, so uh, um, this is an evolving field, and there's other people on this call who know a lot more about this than I do. But um, in general, um, you know, for a stable patient um, who gets PCI, 
will often just do six months of DAPT. And in, in high, high bleeding risk groups, we can even do one month. That's been shown to be uh, safe with current generation drug eluting stents. So we can definitely abbreviate it. In ACS patients, we tend to uh, continue it for at least a year, um, assuming that their bleeding risk is not too high. And that's not just for the stent, but that's for other lesions to help hopefully prevent uh, myocardial infarction. Um, but this is evolving, as I said, and, and there was a study called Twilight, which just recently looked at using single antiplatelet therapy in ACS patients after three months of DAPT uh, using ticagrelor, and it was shown to be um, equivalent as far as ischemic outcomes and lower risk of bleeding. So we are moving towards shorter uh, duration. In this patient's case, actually, he was young and felt to be low bleeding risk, and he had a high burden of disease. And we thought that the ischemic risk was still higher in him and that continuing dual antiplatelet made sense. Um, actually, I didn't mention it, but at this clinic visit, we decided to um, pull off his ticagrelor and just go with aspirin alone. So um, I think it's an evolving field. Perfect, excellent. And I know that you're, you're doing several studies um, in transplant patients. Uh, Dr. Valentine asks if uh, these methods can be used to guide the management of transplant vasculopathy and uh, any chance that we can actually develop these really good, robust, randomized clinical trials in, in our transplant populations. Thank you for that question. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, that's, that's our hope for sure. Um, Dr. Valentine and Dr. Cush and others, uh, and I just published um, some papers looking at the role of physiology um, in transplant patients and showing that it can be prognostically important that if you have a low FFR or this other index that we measure called IMR or the index of microcirculatory resistance, um, which just looks at the microvasculature, kind of the black box of the coronary circulation, that if you have an abnormal IMR, that also predicts uh, adverse events. Um, and the key question is, can we modify that by um, altering therapy? And so that's our hope is to now move on to, we know they're now prognostically important. Can we move on to randomized studies where we uh, take patients with abnormal physiology and maybe augment their immunosuppressive therapy? And um, my hope is that, yes, we will be able to move forward with these studies and uh, show that it can improve patient care. Perfect. And then uh, Dr. Kodelko um, poses a question. So in light of kind of the ischemia trial coupled with FAME3, is there any benefit to following these patients longer term with uh, periodic stress testing or exercise testing as opposed to saying, let's, let's fix it with the PCI or cabbage? Yeah, so um, we are moving away from routine stress testing. Um, I think we feel um, the ischemia trial showed us that in general, the main benefit of revascularization is symptom relief. Mm -hmm. And so if you have an asymptomatic patient, regardless of whether or not they have ischemia, as long as they don't have left main disease, which was excluded in that study, medical therapy does quite well. I think if, so in general, our recommendation is to follow patients symptomatically if they start having symptoms that are refractory to medical therapy, or if they, after you know, making an informed decision, choose to undergo revascularization because they want to improve their symptoms and potentially decrease their MI rate, um, then we will go forward with revascularization. But So I think the role of stress testing and uh, guidelines will likely reflect this um, is becoming less and less in our, in our uh, routine follow-up of patients. Perfect. And then Dr. Kalwani asks, I know we're running a little late, but uh, Dr. Kalwani asks about, um, um, are there opportunities to make these trials more pragmatic in their design uh, so that, you know, because we have to do it on a shoestring bu budget. Um, yeah, no, that's a great point. And Dr. Harrington uh, published an editorial uh, in the New England Journal on the BEST trial, which was another, um, PCI versus cabbage study that I didn't talk about um, out of Korea. And in that study or in that editorial, he nicely uh, highlights the need to make these uh, more pragmatic and do things like, for example, that are done in Sweden um, with the, the Swedish, the SCAR registry, where they embed randomization into their clinical care. And it would be great if we could um, incorporate that to, um, like, like Dr. Kalwani says, make these more 
uh, pragmatic and also more inclusive um, and uh, larger studies. Perfect. And then the last question we have is from Dr. Doherty. Um, what if uh, you do an FFR, it's greater than 0.8, you know, how do you manage these patients long term? Yeah, very good question. Um, I think, I mean, it's important to remember that FFR is a spectrum um, and we have to choose a cutoff uh, at some point, but, you know, if you're above 0.8, it doesn't mean you have a zero point event rate. And if you're below 0.8, you're not going to have a hundred percent event rate. So we do manage these patients very aggressively. They have coronary disease. It's just not functionally significant and it's less likely to cause events, but we still pay close attention to their lipids, their blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera, and uh, lifestyle. And so I think it's really important to remember that. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Fioran. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Harrington. So Bill, thank you. That was really terrific. And uh, congratulations on, uh, on leading the study, getting the results reported in a timely fashion. And I agree with Eldrin. I think that the work that you've been doing in coronary physiology has been, uh, has been transformative for the way we practice. We, we definitely don't think of coronary lesions as the old, uh, as was said, the oculostenotic reflex, but more trying to take a thoughtful approach to, uh, to the complexity of the anatomy, the flow, et cetera. So thank you for doing that. I'll also give you a big shout out for something that both Ischemia with Dave Marin and Fame 3 showed, and you mentioned this, um, medical therapy. Medical therapy is really good and much better than it was in the days when uh, the trials were compared to essentially aspirin alone. And, uh, and so kudos to you for pushing such aggressive medical therapy in, um, in FAME 3 and for David for really pushing it in ischemia. So thank you both. Uh, thanks to our audience. Errol, as always, thanks uh, to you for moderating. And we look forward to seeing people next week at Medical Grand Rounds. Until then, stay safe, uh, wear your mask, wash your hands, and uh, get tested if you're symptomatic. Um, but let's, uh, let's all try to look after each other. So thanks, everybody. See you next week.